hi everyone uh, as i told you in my last lecture that uh, we'll have to start with victorian poetry which is the 19th century british literature as a part of your cc10 syllabus we are beginning with the victorian age today in general because uh, before we proceed to the two poetries that i have in your syllabus we'll have to do uh, the social and intellectual background of the victorian age and this is kind of a background of the victorian poetry uh, and it is important to do this part because uh, you will find ample reflections of these traits these characters of the victorian age in the two poetries uh, that uh, is there in your syllabus so starting with a very basic thing what is victorian age victorian age is basically uh, the reign of queen victoria which stretched from uh, 1837 to 1901 it's a very long reign that queen victoria had she was the queen of great britain or the united kingdom and uh, apart from the great britain or united kingdom she was also the head of the colonial states because uh, as you can understand from the dates that this was a part where colonization uh, was at its height and britain was uh, in charge of many colonies including india so queen victoria was also the empress of india if we so call her now i have uh, divided this uh, background or the social or intellectual background into several parts because uh, if i do it uh, do this in one part it would be a very very long video so i have decided to do it in a few parts maybe four or five so this is the first part of the video and we'll see these characters or traits of the the general uh, character and trait of the victorian age in parts so this is the first part where we deal with uh, the scientific progress or the spirit of scientific progress and along with that the crisis of faith and this uh, this uh, crisis this duality this antagonism between uh, scientific progress and faith uh, rests at the very heart of victorian age and finds ample reflection in uh, any victorian literature for that matter so uh, we'll begin with this uh, the social and intellectual background of this age now uh, coming to the history of religious faith in the beginning of the 19th century uh, there was obviously a faith which dominated the society and uh, it was a very uh, god centric society where god was at the middle of everything uh, and there was of course uh, from even the beginning of the 19th century there have been uh, considerable scientific progress and uh, discovery new discoveries and everything but uh, religious faith Uh, like uh, like uh, as the belief of god belief of the presence of god and science these two which were uh, exact antagonist with each other two opposites were seen to be in a beauti beautiful accordance like they uh, both science and religion religious faith they accommodated each other within themselves so this was in the beginning of the 19th century now there was uh, the study of god's word in the uh, god's word in the bible uh, which which was the theological study and uh, there were a considerable part of the population who was interested in theology and uh, there were two uh, like parallel belief in the god centric system one was the theology or the bible which was supposed to be uh, direct words or direct commandments from god itself and uh, there was also a uh, nature uh, which acted as the representation of god's work and this was a very romantic idea in the beginning of the 19th century means uh, romantic uh, age is still not um, over yet so uh, victorian uh, age i think uh, you know that it follows the romantic uh, age which we have previously done so uh, in the beginning of the 19th century it was still the uh, the romantic belief of nature uh, which was supposed to be the representation of god's work and this was also an element of faith and these two ways these two ideas uh, these two approaches rather to god uh, they uh, kind of led to the same truth 
and that same truth uh, in the bible or uh, nature as representation these two uh, two same truth uh, these two uh, approaches actually led to the same truth which was the truth of an omniscient and uh, merciful god now uh, in 1802 uh, william pale uh, he uh, published a book called natural theology or evidences of the existence and attributes of the deity collected from the appearances of nature and this book it kind of showed natural objects uh, and uh, the author meant that these natural objects they showed evidences of god's design because god was the sole creator of this universe he created everything all plants and animals all species everything was created by god and there is an universal balance in everything uh, because um, that's how god designed the universe to be and function so everything is god's design that's what uh, natural theology in 1802 it said now there were several scientific discoveries of course between 1800 and 1830 the first 30 years of uh, the 19th century but in uh, 1833 between 1833 and 1836 there were published the bridgewater treatises uh, which were a, a series of five to six treatises and it showed how natural theology uh, could be reconfigured in various ways to accommodate these new discoveries now uh, as i've said that was the spirit of the begin at least the first half of the 19th century that both science uh, scientific uh, thought and religious faith they coexisted with each other and this bridgewater treatises uh, it showed that uh, natural theology or the study of god and creation it could be reconfigured to accommodate the several scientific discoveries that happened between 1800 and 1830 so uh, suppose there were uh, uh, some scientific discoveries and these theologians uh, they changed theology uh, they edited the natural theology in such a way that it showed that these scientific discoveries were not really uh, man made but these scientific discoveries could also be defined or uh, let's say uh, um, deduced uh, by uh, natural theology like uh, in the belief of god now this was the harmony between uh, science of science and faith that th that always existed till uh, that was really mainstream till 1860 that was a part of uh, at least the popular belief till 1860s now there were some counter cultures to this popular belief to this mainstream belief counter culture is something that is uh, that is not a part of uh, mainstream belief but it counters or challenges the mainstream belief so there were a few let's say minor counter cultures that uh, were there between the first 60 years of 19th century and uh, these counter cultures were kind of threats to the religious establishment or theology that existed in the first half of the victorian age now the first came that was not from britain uh, that came in 1820s in france uh, and this might be one of the uh, one of the effects of the french revolution which of course ended before now there were some forms of science uh, which suggested that uh, the role of god or the existence of god is really restricted or non existent there were some scientific discoveries some thesis that was published in 1820s in france that challenged the existence of god in any way uh, in the universe and uh, this undermined kind of the anglican the politico religious sentiment because uh, as you uh, understand and present uh, and also from our present scenario that uh, politics and religion kind of goes hand to hand to strengthen each other now that was the case in victorian society as well now th these counter cultures were the only thing that challenged these beliefs now the next challenge the next counter culture came in 1840s this time in britain itself now some british uh, geologists uh, they made some discoveries which were uh, really concrete evidence 
that the earth's processes uh, uh, it was a study of the earth, earth's processes that this geology studied and uh, this were not kind of matching with the book of Genesis now the book of Genesis is a part of the Old Testament of the Bible and it talks about the creation of the world and these British geologists they studied some of the earth's processes that kind of did not match uh, match with the knowledge that match with the things that were said in the book of Genesis of the Bible now one of them was that it was found that the earth was at least at least 1000 years older than what the Bible suggests the Bible suggested one date where the earth was created and the universe was created and everything was created by God these geologists studied some of the earth's processes and came out with concrete evidence that the earth was at least 1000 years 1000 years more older than what the Bible suggests and this discovery in the 1840s by the British uh, geologist it kind of started to create this tension between the opposing forces religious men and the men of science uh, the tension that uh, is a characteristic feature of the Victorian age now 1840s as you know it, it was kind of the start of the Victorian age and uh, there, there is this tension that was there between the opposing forces of religion and science and this was because till now uh, the theologians, the theologists rather they were kind of accommodating every scientific, scientific discovery or new scientific invention with that of religion and they kind of gave a, a description of everything that these scientific discoveries were also part of theology and a part of God's design and this was the first time that uh, they couldn't because these geologists and the, these, these British geologists they came with some concrete evidence and that was the result of the tension this was the start of the tension now the major uh, groundbreaking thing happened in 1859 and this is most important uh, in 1859 Charles Darwin published his thesis uh, called the origin of the species and earlier the earlier threats to the religion they were small counter currents small counter cultures that existed but they were not a part of the mainstream belief till 1859 uh, the 1860s it was part of the popular belief that science and religion co uh, could um, coexist together in harmony in some kind of harmony now this was really shattered this harmony was really shattered when in 1859 Charles Darwin published his thesis called the origin of the species and it came out with the evolutionary biology which is a whole new creation of this universe of every species of this world and this theory of evolution this theory of creation this could no longer be reconciled with existing religious beliefs whatsoever there was there was no opportunity of reconciling both this Charles Darwin's uh, theories and existing religious beliefs and this harmony that existed till 1860s was now no longer possible and it kind of had many consequences like Darwin in his thesis called uh, this evolutionary notion of natural selection he called it natural selection and this kind of eliminated God the eliminated role of any God in the crea creation of various species in the creation of creation of this universe it was said in the Bible that uh, God first created man and then the woman and then he created other plants and animals of this universe uh, and he made this earth very beautifully he created this earth but this this uh, this theory of natural selection kind of eliminates God from the role of the creator and this was a major setback for religion because this was a direct challenge to the image of God as the creator of this universe another thing which was very important in Darwin's thesis was that Darwin said that human 
descends from non-human forms. And as you know, this was a very popular slogan. It probably still is. The Darwin says we come from monkeys. And obviously this was not written in Darwin's thesis because it was uh, Darwin was an anthropologist. He was much more scientific in his thesis. His language was much more scientific. But it was a popular slogan in Victorian age when Darwin's thesis was starting to get popular. That Darwin says we come from monkeys. And this was a direct challenge in man's image. Now this raises questions about man's uniqueness. Now previously in a God-centric universe, humans believed that God created man in his own image. Now when Darwin proved in his theory that human being were a descendant of apes, which was a non-human form, human beings uh, in, in a, through the process of evolution, human beings uh, came into survive into came into existence from apes. Now this was a direct challenge to this fact that God created man in his own image and this statement was no longer true. Now this fact previously that God created human being in his own image, this was a matter of pride. For, for human beings it was a matter of pride that has been felt from the renaissance uh, where they created the chain of beings with uh, god on top uh, the angels below it and just below the god and the angels there was man and plants animals and every other species they were below human beings in in the chain of being and that was a matter of pride that was the anthropocentric ego of man now when you realize for the very first time that all this was not so and you have you have not been created in the image of god you are not the son of god uh, now you evolved from apes from monkeys and this was a direct attack on the anthropocentric ego of man that was there and it questions that chain of being which was there from the renaissance itself from the uh, renaissance age itself now man was no longer the center of the universe according to darwin's thesis and man human being was not so special like uh, every species now was a product of evolution so human beings were not special human beings are also uh, products of evolution so was the other plants so were the other animals like higher animals like tigers and lions and even lower animals like monkeys like the like a donkey rather all the all these base animals also evolved in their present forms and so did man and this was a really big challenge really big thing for man to accept that man which uh, till now believed that he was created by God and he looks like God, God, create, God has created him in his own image, now suddenly realizes that that was not so and he is no more special than any other species. So this was very difficult for man to accept. Another thing that uh, Darwin said that life has come into existence by chance and accident. So evolution it was a very long process and there, there is no divine plan uh, that actually uh, created this evolution. So there was no divine plan, it was just accident. Evolution happened by accident, it was just chance that man became man. So there is no divine plan and there is no God who cared for his subjects and we are products of evolution we are no subjects or children of God and this is I think best described in Thomas Hardy because uh, this philosophy of chance and accident uh, which was actually a Victorian became a Victorian pop, a part of the Victorian popular culture after Darwin's thesis was adopted by Thomas Hardy in a great way and another thing uh, that Darwin said that 
we could exist because it was the survival of the fittest and the species which we are seeing now has evolved in that way and only the fittest of the species are surviving now and in this process of evolution which took thousands of years to actually happen many of the species have died and it is only uh, possible for the fittest to, to survive and this was the struggle for existence uh, that was that was inherent in evolution and this was not in terms with the universal harmony that religion had taught them now in in the universal harmony uh, this whole universe was god's design and man and every other plant every other animal every other species what pa was part of the design and uh, every other species actually existed because of god's benevolence and god's mercy now this survival of the fittest where everyone had to struggle for existence uh, this was not really in terms with uh, the universal philosophy the universal harmony philosophy that was a part of theology part of religion now this the scientific progress and along with it the development of a scientific temperament in the society this split the victorian society into two halves one uh, who actually were men who believed in science and this scientific temperament and could actually adapt to the scientific temperament which was the new world order and the other half of the victorian society they couldn't adapt to this new system this new order and they were still conservatives who actually believed in god and this split in the victorian society is best best expressed in victorian poetry in all in all in matthew arnold uh, it it kind of showed a kind of pessimism which was the world of doubt and skepticism which which a uh, scientific thought had triggered this doubt and skepticism and it is best expressed in matthew arnold's dover beach uh, which said the sea of faith was once too at the full at the earth's round shore the sea of faith which was god's benevolence and religious faith this was kind of a protective layer in existence round the earth and now i only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar and now this sea of faith now this protective layer of god's benevolence now it's slowly withdrawing and human being realize that we are alone in this universe we are alone in this uncaring universe and there is no god to actually protect us so this uh, throws man into the depths of pessimism that is best expressed by matthew arnold and arnold is kind of a, of a representative poet of this pessimism now the other part of this was obviously the optimism which was there in the conservative population because many people still believed god and totally disowned scientific progress uh, it's not that robert browning is one of them but this optimism can be seen in robert browning uh, some of the robert browning's poems like in pipa passes he says god is in his heaven and all's right with the world so god is in his heaven and there is nothing to worry everything is right with the world so this was a kind of optimism that robert browning has showed and at the end of this lecture i would like to say that after this uh, after darwin's thesis after this rise of the new scientific temperament and its and its conflict with the existing religious beliefs uh, there we have as a result of this a world of conflict and this is best expressed again again by arnold and he write in uh, grand chartreuse that wandering between two worlds one dead the other powerless to be born and this is the two worlds the two belief system the old one the old one of religious belief the old world of faith which was now dead 
uh, after the scientific uh, discovery scientific beliefs and the new world which was still powerless to be born still at the nascent stage still not right in the center of our society too powerless to be born but is there is the um, is the world of science and scientific progress is the world of skepticism it's a world of doubt so this was the two world it is best expressed in matthew arnold's grand charters and this ends the first part of uh, this lecture about uh, social and intellectual background of the victorian age of victorian poetry in specific now uh, you have one poem called tennyson uh, is called ulysses by tennyson and uh, you also see both ulysses and telemachus the ulysses son telemachus in that poem now uh, obviously uh, ulysses apart from the literal meaning of the poem it also has a metaphorical meaning that we'll discuss we can see ulysses actually representing and we can see the representation of this world of conflict in ulysses as well so i hope you uh, read the poems that are in a, in your syllabus and i have also given you several other poems that i thought were very uh, that were some of the great works of the two poets uh, tennyson and browning and i have selected those poems because i think they kind of really represent this victorian world so i hope you read the poem at your leisure uh, the both which are in your syllabus and the other poems that i have given you so you get an idea of this and we'll continue with the series of lecture with social and intellectual background from next lecture onwards so thank you